So, fun story. Hit me with it. So, I walk out of the bathroom, and I can't see anything because it's dark out, and we don't turn on any lights, but it's like a very open area. Mm -hmm. But Ryan is standing there, and I can't register that it's him until too late. And my reaction was the dumbest reaction ever. At first, I was like, (laughs) I'm going to lose my shit just trying to tell you what it was. But I was like, "Uh, uh, (laughs) Like, I felt like a little old lady the way I was, like, shaking my hands. I was like, what? And it lasted for too long. And he was like... I was like, it took me a second to read. Like, it just looked like there was a dark figure. And oh, then I was that's like, so scary. But he, like, he's got a t shirt on that has writing on it. And I registered that there was writing on his shirt. Yeah, but you don't but know what it like, says. Maybe it says, like, <laughs> Dear Chelsea, I'm here to murder you. <laughs> if you're seeing this, it's too late. <laughs> he was like, Did you. Did you think I was the Mothman? And I was like, no, no I, I just thought you were going to murder me. <laughs> yeah, nothing like a good scare to get the blood flow in. <laughs> uh, that's right, everybody. Welcome to Never Show the Monster. I'm Kelly Attaway. I'm Chelsea Hollander. And today we are talking about the movie The Mothman Prophecies. Wouldn't it be crazy if we weren't and Ryan was just like, did you think I was the Mothman? Like a very he specific... Really loves the <laughs> And this will be the final movie in our cryptids series. And Aww. I think that we did it again. We accidentally watched an alien movie. Mm-hmm. Okay. I love that that's your what? response because we're going to get into it. Okay. So okay. <laughs> this movie is based on a nonfiction book by a man named John Keel, who was a journalist and I guess paranormal investigator is what you'd call him. He's so mm. much more than that, though. <laughs> and um, did I say this was based on, I think, maybe loosely did you read inspired the book? by. Yeah, I did. Okay. Not for this episode, but. Um, I have a lot of questions, so. I'm glad because all of the notes I wrote down were about the book. So. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that'll be good. Maybe I have some of the answers. But before we get into it, I have two things to tell you. Yes. One, I guess this is a question. It's also okay. a, it's also a fact. <laughs> You're going to learn something from my question. Did you know that Woody Harrelson's father was a hitman? Huh. Convicted and I'm reasonably sure put to death. Oh. How many people did he? Couldn't tell you. Heard it on a podcast, did Google it enough to, like, verify that that was true, Hmm. and mostly was just like, what the fuck? (laughs) Ooh, the more you know. The more you know. He was a natural-born killer. Whoa. Whoa. Weird. Do you think he is a natural-born killer? Do you think he's been up to something this whole time? Allegedly, no slander. No slander here. I'll never show the monster. (laughs) I think I saw a TikTok that talked about Ben Affleck being an undercover agent. Oh, whoa. After it gave me some facts, I was like, you know, and I was like, man, okay. <laughs> You're really good into conspiracies. Have you seen what Ben Affleck is up to with his, mm, I guess, production Jennifer company? Lopez? Oh, okay. No, no. no. <laughs> we don't need to see what he's doing with Jennifer Lopez. We can he just seems imagine. seems not super happy. So, well, that, I think that might just be his face. He looks very happy with Jennifer Garner, but I feel like anybody would be happy with Jennifer Garner. Her smile is contagious. It really is. Yeah. Those dimples. God damn. <laughs> I know. Yep. But also, the world has changed a lot since then. So, mm, I feel mm-hmm, like it's easier to mm-hmm. be sad these days. That's completely fair. Here I am blaming it on a woman. What is oh wrong my God. with me? <sighs> What is wrong with me? <laughs> fuck me. Fuck me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fuck you. It's I'm angry. <laughs> you're personifying John Keel, who was pretty sexist. So you're just on Mothman brand oh, right okay, now. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. <sighs> thank God. Okay. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I've been continuing to watch that series on the History Channel about Skinwalker Ranch, <laughs> the name of which I still don't know. <laughs> Is it just is it just Skinwalker Ranch or is I it like I, I, no I think it's like a phrase okay the history of Skinwalker Ranch Skinwalker okay. Ranch behind the scenes I don't I don't remember what it is but oh god it is Skinwalking no, that's it yeah <laughs> okay, <sorry. laughs> 
No, it's bad. It's not good. Um, but there is something weird that they the stress. The secret of Skinwalker Ranch. The secret of Skinwalker mm-hmm. Ranch. Thank mm-hmm. you. Please tell me more. Yeah, there's something weird that they stress that I don't remember from any of the lore that I hmm. knew prior to this, which is that digging on the ranch causes a spike in activity. Really? And there's, uh, according to this show. Oh. <laughs> that is which on is ostensibly channel. nonfiction. Yeah, who knows? Um, but he, uh, the, so, okay. So on this ranch, there's like a small group of investigators, one of whom, the security guy, uh, is named Dragon. Love him. He's my favorite so far. Boy, regrettably, he might Should also I be not? my favorite. <laughs> I was like, is there, are you about to tell me a really terrible story of Dragon? I mean, I don't, I don't like any of them. He's the one who's always carrying a gun. And I'm like, what are you going to do? What, you're going to shoot the monster? What are you going to do? Yeah. What's going to happen here? Um, but there's one guy who was digging on the ranch and started to get like a crazy headache. And it oh. got worse and worse and worse. And he ended up having to go to the ER and like, oh, his skin was separating from his what and there was like a weird fluid sack in there so much pain he was in the hospital for a while apparently it was like a real life and death type thing though maybe that's being played up for the drama of the show Mm. um but they say that the doctors were like i don't know what the fuck happened and eventually he healed and then he went back to the ranch Mm -mm. And now every time, like, obviously scientists come in and they're like, well, if digging spikes activity, we should dig so that we can spike the activity and capture it. And everybody's like, no, think about Teddy in his head. Yeah. Like, well, get Teddy off the ranch. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Get him out of here. And so they have like a no digging rule. uh, But they were, I don't know, they did like an all night stakeout. Um and were capturing like radio waves or something and this guy started to get a headache (gasps) right in the same spot and they could like feel the fluid building up under his skin yeah so they were like get him off the ranch now take him to the er now and he you know went to the doctor and they were like it's for sure the same thing that happened last time and we still do not know what the fuck so I don't know what's going on over there, Skinwalker Ranch. Is there something in the dirt? Is it like radioactive dirt? <sighs> they think that maybe not radioactive, but that maybe there's something, some sort of structure under the dirt. Oh, like maybe no. some sort of metal something. That Because they're also capturing like weird um, electromagnetic patterns. Okay. However, in that episode, um, they seemed to have ruled out the below the dirt structure thing Mm. um and instead where they like triangulated where these weird signals were coming from and they were coming from about a mile above the ranch oh which is weird is it or does it make complete sense i mean tomato tomato that's where they would be right if it's aliens you mean when it's aliens (laughs) (laughs) you're right i did mispronounce that you're right you're right (laughs) Okay, do you want to get into the Mothman prophecies? Yes, I do. Okay, so for those of you who have not read or seen this movie, this is about a Washington Post reporter who is named John Klein, loosely based on John Keel. He is inexplicably drawn to the town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where there is this ongoing flap of paranormal phenomena that he... Starts investigating, and there are repeated sightings amongst this phenomena of, like, a giant moth-like creature with glowing red eyes. And all of this culminates in the collapse of the Silver Bridge, which is the bridge that connects West Virginia to Ohio, or I guess past tense, connected West Virginia to Ohio. And uh, in the movie, 36 people died in that bridge collapse. In real life, it was 46 Oh, I thought it was in the 60s, but I feel like Wikipedia was super wrong and I had to go to different sources. Oh, what did Wikipedia to figure say? out what happened? The dates it gave me, I was like, I'm pretty sure this happened in the 60s. And as I was going through it, it said in the 80s, 
This is what happened. Whoa. And then the last name of the couple was Scary Berry. And I was like, that sounds like bullshit. <laughs> oh, but if your last the, name is Scary um, Berry, I want to hear everything. <laughs> Scarberry. Oh, it said, okay. Well, it said Scary Berry. <laughs> I bet it did. Yeah, but that's what they were going for. <laughs> okay. That um, That's the name of, so the very first Mothman sighting in Point Pleasant was seen by two couples who were okay. out in the, um, oh gosh, it's out by the TNT plant. The, the TNT, yeah, but the chemical the, plant is what they call the, it in the movie. Yeah, the quote unquote TNT mm-hmm. area is what they call it in <laughs> the book. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they saw him first, and uh, we, I don't know what they were up to out there. Some people say that they were like teens and this was like a lover's lane situation but some sources say that they were grown-ups and that they were out there drag racing <laughs> so i don't know what they no, were doing <laughs> i like both of them i know i yeah. like the drag racing the most i found out one of my former managers was like a a car racer whoa raced cars and her does he know her her sorry does she know vin diesel no she like raced cars in india or something there have been a lot of fast and furious movies have they gone over there yet is it fast and furious india drift yeah. <laughs> what's another what's another car? India Parallel Park. I don't know anything you can do in a car. <laughs> I don't know anything. Uh, India mm, Papa Wheelie. India How do you like donut. what is or, Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Would you like to hear some facts and figures about this Please, movie? So much. Mothman so. Prophecies came out in 2002. The screenplay, which is <laughs> Boy, could you imagine? Well, you haven't read the book. Adapting the book must have been a fucking nightmare. So, shout out to (laughs) Richard Hadam. Hadam? 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 I don't know. Uh, He wrote the screenplay, like I said, based on the 1975 book by John Keel, same name. The director is Mark Pellington. Oh, who has directed Ben Affleck in his very first movie? Ben Affleck and Rachel Weiss. I know, I don't remember the name. Of the movie at this point. Um, This movie stars Richard Gere as John Klein, who is um, loosely based on John Keel. Uh, Mm -hmm. But there's another character in the movie who like... Leak? Leak. Leak. Keel, backwards. You get it. I like it. I'm a fan. You get it. And he plays uh, like the more paranoid aspects of John Keel. And then we've got Laura Linney as Connie Mills, who is a police officer and um, very in touch with the community of Point Pleasant. We've got Will Patton as Gordon Smallwood, who is a local man who starts having um, premonitions, prophecies, Mm -hmm. prophecies, Mm -hmm. you might call them. We've got Deborah Messing, surprise, uh, just um, a little bit in the movie. She plays Richard Gere's wife who passes in, like, the first, first I don't know, five minutes of the movie. Yeah. Perfectly. And then Mark Pellington, the director, um, does the voice of Indrid Cold. And um, all of these people are based on real-life people that are featured in the book. So, obviously, we've got John Keel. Then Connie Mills, the sheriff, is sort of based on Mary Heyer, who was a journalist in the 60s. Who um, She's the one who had the presence in the water dream. Mm-hmm. And Gordon Smallwood is based on uh, Woodrow Woody Derenberger, who is the, you know, uh, in the movie... Gordon meets Indrid Cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, real life, Darren Berger is the person who meets Indrid Cold for the first time. And Indrid Cold is like bigger than the Mothman prophecies. I want to talk more about Indrid Cold. We'll, after. We're going to okay, have great. to. I'm so excited. <laughs> we are going to have to. And then, yeah, Indrid Cold in the movie is just like this weird electronic voice that we hear over the phone. But in real life, he's a dude. Um He's just a he's just, dude. He's a dude. I mean, he's maybe an alien. He's maybe an ultra terrestrial, but he's he looks human, uh, tallish, um, pretty charming, pretty handsome. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> so it was weird to to hear him as just like this weird electronic voice. I was like, oh, I always thought he was like affable and not weird. <laughs> so have you seen like not conversations with them, interviews? That's what they're called. Whoa. Oh, with Woody? With Indrid Cold. Oh no, there are like videos with Indrid? Okay. 
All the pictures I'm seeing are very scary and they make me very uncomfortable. No, there's that weird grinning man thing. I don't know. Yeah, what's that? What's that about? I don't know what that's about. Well, the grinning man, like, they are using the grinning man from that movie from a long time ago. But that's not Andrew Cold. What movie? The Joker. It's the one that the Joker was based on. We think that that might be Injured Cold? No. No. That's a picture that they keep showing for him, though. But I don't know if that's like a cover art for a band that made a song. Oh, it was very know. hard. It was very hard to look up certain things because for some reason I kept getting bands and music with the same names of things I was looking up. I was even trying to like get some more history about high strangeness because I think that John Keel like coined that term but that is now the name of an episode of Adventure Time and that is the only thing that was coming up I was like god damn it (laughs) like I don't have time to read my weird UFO books right now to get to the bottom of this (laughs) well I was recently thinking about trying to get access to the university library to study some things And I was like, I think I need more access to more books that I may or may not look at for information. Is it restricted? Sometimes university libraries aren't, like, they're open to the public. I think you can go in and look at them, but to check them out, you have to go through a process. I have to fill out a form and say why I need it. I'm a curious cat. Is that? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It should be. Yeah, so this movie, um, talk about Never Show the Monster, am I right? (laughs) Oh, yeah, they don't. (laughs) Not a single monster in this movie. If I had to talk about how scary it was, though, I'd probably say it's in the negatives. Really? You think so? Yeah, I wasn't really scared at all. Okay. No, it's more like... Maybe just Richard Gere calms me. Oh. He's very soothing. He is. You're right. And it's very... um, even when it's weird, it's very, <laughs> I just thought, I thought about what I was going to say before I said it, which is that in and, in and of itself is high strangeness. I never do that. But I was going to say it's very even keel. Do you get it? John uh, keel. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, but yeah, it's just like a very subdued tone until the end of the movie when things pop off. Yeah. Like when, is it Gordon? Who's the guy? Because you said two names. Sorry, you said Woody. Wait, hold on. Yeah, Woody Derenberger is the real life name of Gordon Smallwood. So Gordon Smallwood, there is a part where he's like talking crazy stuff. And Richard Gere is just like, "Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I especially liked that scene because um, uh, I'm going to call him Woody the whole time. Gordon. Gordon I feel like both is, of them fit very well. Know, truly. He is telling Richard Gere, who I'm going to call Richard Gere, uh, like, I had a headache last night. And Richard Gere is nodding. And he's like, so I went into the bathroom to get some aspirin. And Richard Gere goes, uh-huh. And I, like, <laughs> just, like, vocalizing uh-huh made me made me laugh. <laughs> like, that's a funny, <laughs> this is a scary movie, uh, ostensibly. Yeah. It's a weird movie. And we're just, like, talking about aspirin real casually while Richard Gere is trying to buy, like, cassette tapes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were definitely parts of it that I found super interesting and somewhat scary. Like, there were pieces of it, but as a whole, I wasn't like, mm, this is going to give me nightmares. Yeah, I don't know. Even though I did see red glowing eyes outside of my window. You met the Mothman. But I have no prophecy. Yet. Ooh. <laughs> But I think I would go along the lines of ignoring it. I'm pretty good at it, pretending that stuff's not happening. No, that's no, not I'm true. Terrible we talk at about it. this Never all the mind. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hyper-focus on everything terrible that's happening all the time. <laughs> or like weird. Like if you hear the noise, you're going to investigate. If you start having prophecies, especially if you have that prophecy that like 99 people are going to die in Denver and then the next day you see that a plane crashed and 99 people died in Denver, you're going to be like... Yeah, I would hate that. If you were to get prophecies of something, would you want to have prophecies of what's going to happen? I feel like that made me... As somebody who has anxiety all the time and always wants to know... Who always prepares for the worst. Right. Just pretty constantly. I do not think I would ever want to know. Well, the weird thing about these prophecies 
And I will elaborate on the prophecies that happened in real life. But the way that they happen in the movie is that they're like very esoteric. Like what do those Mm -hmm. mean? It's just like words and imagery that don't really make sense until after the thing happens. So is that better or worse? Like, are you like, do you end up hyper fixating on those thoughts? Like wondering what they mean? Or do you get better at figuring out what they mean? I think the part that got me was when Laura Linney is telling Richard Gere, because I cannot remember the name of their characters, whenever she's like, it's going to happen no matter what. And I'm like, I mean, it's going to. It is. Yeah. Like, do I want to know? No, no. I, and then, like what Leek said got to me too. I just thought a lot about if I had prophecies. I wasn't scared. It was just like, mm, I hope I don't ever get <laughs> prophecies. <laughs> yeah, not scary, but there were a couple parts that like gave me goosebumps. Oh, yeah. There were definitely, there were really good scenes in it that I thought were done very well. Yeah, absolutely. The one scene with the mirror <gasps> and like Richard Gere's on the phone and then he like turns, but the head doesn't turn in the mirror and then it turns. When he turns again. Yeah. I was like, that oh, was weird. that's good. That's good. I was like, that's good. Like we see, I feel like we see that in horror movies a lot. Like reflection moves independently of the, of the character. But, but this it wasn't, wasn't like called out. No, this was very mm-hmm. subtle. And it also wasn't meant to be horror. It was meant to be like time. Like, mm-hmm. like the whole thing about injured cold which we'll which we'll get into is he he even asks it in this movie they they sneak it in what is your time cycle like that's a thing that injured cold asks all the time and it seems to be because he's like he's not experiencing time linearly the way that we are or that we think we are and so that like little mirror play because the mirror doesn't react just independently of richard Gere's motion it performs the action before Richard Gere performs the action. Mm. So, like, the mirror is a premonition, almost. No. I might have to go back and rewatch it. I bought it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did, too. I was like, uh, yeah, I know I'm going to love this I preemptively this bought it. I was like, oh, I'm probably going to watch it again at some point. There were definitely scenes that I really liked. And that was that was definitely one of them. Neither of us had seen this before. I had seen clips on TNT. Oh, you'd seen clips. Yeah, because it used to play on TNT all the time. Um, I didn't expect much, uh, but it was exactly what I thought it would be. Okay. But no more, no less. I think maybe I've seen the end before. Oh, sure. Um, so I kind of already knew how things were going to go. That's also just fact. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that part's just history. But I do like vaguely remember the presence part, like her talking about presence. And I was like, oh, because that's where they're going to be, because it's around Christmas. What did you know of Mothman before this movie, wherein you don't learn a ton? Mostly our conversations. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, you really don't learn anything from it. I had to do more research after, but then I didn't trust the resources that I was reading because Wikipedia's dates were super off. That's so weird. They said the 80s. That's crazy. Yeah, but then if you go down, it does talk about the Silver Bridge, or... Happening in 67, but then it also said it happened in 89. Huh. And I was like, that's not, that doesn't add up. Huh. Weird. So then I had to go to different websites. But then I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't put put my trust in Wikipedia, but I put, I put my trust in Wikipedia and I was like, this is weird. And then when I go to outside sources, I'm like, but what's their source? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I get, I get concerned. That was a that was a difficult one. So if anybody wants to go in and fix that Wikipedia article, it's not good. It's not good. Oh, man, we really should have been donating those three dollars every time they asked us to <gasps> to save Wikipedia. This is our fault. Oh. Okay. So wait, we have talked a lot about Mothman recently because I re- because I read Mothman prophecies. So I was giving you like deep cuts. Mm-hmm. What did you know about Mothman prior to that? Just like. What he looks like? Did you know about the bridge? I think I vaguely knew about the bridge. And I think I did know. I knew that a sightings came with something ter- like something terrible happening. But I don't know if that's because of our conversations or something I knew before. Hmm. I think it might have just been because of our conversations. I've been asking p- people if they know Mothman. Hmm. And everybody says yes really confidently. And then they start describing a character in a cartoon. Oh, in Batman? 
I don't think it's Batman. I think it's like Sea Lab. Oh. But I don't know. I don't know that Mothman. But every time I'm like, no, no. Wikipedia no. pointed me towards Batman because then they created a <laughs> Mothman that was a like a villain character. Oh. Was another character in the comic book because of Mothman. That's funny because part of why they chose the name Mothman for this cryptid is because of Batman's popularity. <laughs> yeah. So that's like beautifully self-referential. I like that. That's good. Or I guess not self-referential, but like I like that little relationship they've got yeah. there. That's what is cute. It, what is it called? Like it's not – is it cyclical? What – like one informs the other and then – Yeah. It's like an Ouroboros, a snake Ooh, eating its own yeah. tail. yeah. Yep. I'm into that. So, okay, so did you know about Indrid Cold? So I, the only things I knew about Indrid Cold, and this is why I have so many questions, because I didn't get to do any research on Indrid Cold before this, because I didn't trust any of the sources I was reading. <laughs> um, and obviously, I just tried to Google his face, and it just came up with the grinning man that inspired the Joker. But the only thing I knew about Indrid Cold was from Hellier. And every time uh-huh, they're like, Indrid uh-huh. Cold. And I was like... I don't know what you're I think this is yeah. important, but I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, man. So were you familiar with the phrase high strangeness prior? They don't talk about it in this movie, but that's like a big concept of the book and sort of of this field of study. I think aside from you enlightening me, no. Okay. I'm going to say no. I could lie. I was going to lie about it, but I'm not going <laughs> to. No, no. But why would you know? You would only know <laughs> yeah. if you're, like, interested in weird stuff. Mm. And they do talk about it in Hellier. They say high strangeness in Hellier as well. But, like, the first time I was ever introduced to it was through you. So I'm not going to, like, super crazy. I was just so fascinated. I got to thinking, mm-hmm. like, what – other movies have depicted high strangeness, high strangeness like this, mm-hmm. because this is a really accurate representation of high strangeness, which mm. um, do you feel confident in the definition? I'm going to nope. give it. OK, so it's like <laughs> um, it's like I mean, Hellier is another great example. All of those synchronicities and how like mm. learning one thing about yeah. an experience leads you to something stranger Mm -hmm. so like that's what high strangeness is about like seeing lights in the sky seeing your mothman eyes out your window oh yeah yeah. (laughs) like that's strange yeah but then like let's say you oh there's this great dan Aykroyd story about it he was filming some tv show that was like weird because you know dan Aykroyd loves an alien yeah and so he was working on this tv show they were in studio he gets a call from britney spears which, that's strange. Okay. <laughs> I mean, is it? I don't know. Well, I just don't know wait. about Brittany now. <laughs> okay. Just wait. He gets this call from Brittany. He yes. goes outside to take it. While he's outside, he sees a couple men in suits who don't look quite right. And they are very clearly watching him. Okay. And so he gets off the phone with Brittany, goes back inside. While he was on the phone with Britney Spears Mm -hmm. being eyed up and down by men in black on the street, the studio called, canceled the show, shut the whole thing down. So like that's high strangeness. Like a bunch of weird things happen and individually they're just like, huh. But when they happen all together, you're like, there's meaning here. Like something is happening. And that's like, what this movie represents like there's a bunch of strange things that happen in this movie but when they all happen at the same time you're like well clearly these things are related yeah. even if you can't like pull them together mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sure i'm now lost in thought i'm thinking of like <laughs> all of the pieces of the movie that came together and i'm trying to think of other things that i can relate it to or have seen i was thinking of a couple yes the butterfly effect. So uh, whenever I was telling my brother, I was like, I need to watch Mothman Prophecies tonight. He was like, the one with Ashton Kutcher? <laughs> Close. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like Same vibe. Different one. And I was like, oh, the covers of both the movies are very blue. And then Donnie Darko. I think that that's oh, high strangeness. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Twin Peaks. We can yeah, throw that in yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this movie, we've talked about it before. I've recommended it. I don't think you've seen it yet. The Endless, which is, oh, yeah. um, same person who did not 
After After midnight. midnight. Okay. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I guess there were, like, there has been high strangeness depicted in movies. And then this one just felt weird because it was Richard Gere, I guess. Yeah, it (laughs) doesn't make sense. Like Richard Gere and Deborah Messing. And Laura Linney. All of them. I don't expect them in that kind of a movie. And I think that they, unfortunately, because they have embedded their, like, archetype that they normally Mm. play is so embedded in me. This movie wasn't scary because it was a bunch of what I considered very comforting characters. Well, but I think that that, like... Could add to it. Supports the high strangeness, right? Mm. Like, it's not it's not necessarily weirdos, exclusively weirdos, who are out there having these experiences. Like, uh, Leek talks about it in this movie, how, like, the reason Richard Gere... No, like experiences any of this is because he was perceptive enough yeah. to notice it. Didn't he say because you had him. trauma? Yeah, and I was like, and was oh like, god, nah. we're <laughs> we watching Smile again. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I was like, can we not with this? Can we not? Can we not? Who hasn't in this day and age? I mean, I mean, as a society, we've experienced some extreme trauma. That's true, but he did, you know, see his wife bash her head Fine. against the side of a car. <laughs> Fine. Did we have to get that graphic? Like, yeah, never show the monster, but also never show head trauma. <laughs> yeah, that's I don't want to see it. And I certainly don't want to hear it. We didn't need that, like, wet thud. I Ugh. do appreciate, what is it, the sound artist? The people oh, who the Foley? The Foley, yeah. They're great. <laughs> yeah. Also, the soundtrack was cool yeah i have so many more pages of notes and we haven't even described who mothman is is there much to describe about mothman uh large man moth eyes red <laughs> yeah that's right mothman, <laughs> mothman. <laughs> um he also uh yeah humanoid looks like a person big old red eyes not a lot of descriptions of his features Except that he's got big old thick thighs, uh, like a 12-foot wingspan. Okay, question. Yeah. To this. In the book and or previous descriptions, I was reading that they described him as white. Like a white bird. And they said, oh, it's a a sand crane or a heron? A sand hill crane or a barred owl. Yeah, those come up a lot. It is weird that it would be that far off its migration path. That's weird. And also, one of the things that comes up a lot with Mothman is that he doesn't have a neck. And sandhill cranes are, like, all neck. Yeah, they are all neck. I don't know about that. And they also estimate that he's, like, seven or more feet tall. And sandhill cranes only get to about four feet tall. Oh, interesting. You know, I guess I don't know the max flight speed of a sandhill crane. But those drag racers who saw Mothman, (laughs) they were scared. And so they took off like a shot down the road. it flew with them, right? It flew with them. They said that they were going 100 miles an hour, and it was like staying in line with their Mm. car. Sandhill cranes don't fly that fast. Probably. I think that's true. (laughs) I I feel pretty confident. I feel pretty confident. Not super confident. But pretty confident. I'm not Hundo P. As someone who is slowly getting into twitching. Twitching? Yeah. Twitch. Being a twitcher means you are a bird watcher. Oh, I thought you meant like live streaming on Twitch. Yeah, I know. I think that's what they took it from. I think that's where the name comes from. Oh, because you're watching. You're watching them. I see. Uh, I don't want to brag, but when we were at the Grand Canyon, (laughs) we did see a California condor. Whoa. Did you see the canyon, though? It was not. <laughs> As we were driving up, I did tell Ryan the story. <laughs> I was oh. like, just a reminder, Kelly couldn't see shit. <laughs> Fuck the Grand Canyon. <laughs> yeah, I... But you saw it? I did, and I recorded... All the way to the bottom? Did it look yeah. like a hologram? It was... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it looks fucking weird, because it doesn't look real, um, but Yeah, the, it's because it isn't. <laughs> I did have a good time standing at the area of the, the parking lot where people walk up and they see it for the first time. And that moment oh. when you hear people see it for the first time is just like, they're like, it's, it's nice. I just saw a guy go up and be like, what the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> he just kept repeating it over and over again. And I was like, 
Yeah, man. Yeah. That's what you're yeah, seeing. Yeah, and I heard teens going, Grand Canyon. We're like, lame canyon. <laughs> <laughs> love them. Love them. Love the teens. They were love right. The, they love were the right. Gen Zs. Yep. Those Zoomers. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry that you had such a terrible experience. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, I've got another question about yeah. Mothman for you. Do you... Okay. In this movie... It felt to me like they were conflating Mothman and Indrid Cold as though they were the same entity. Yeah, for sure. Okay. They were conflating them. It made me feel like they were the same. They are not, to my un- to Please my. Please tell knowledge. me more about Indrid Cold. Please tell me more. Okay. So, <laughs> he makes me laugh. Um, Indrid Cold is potentially an alien, potentially an ultra terrestrial. So when he meets Woody Derenberger, is he, is he currently uh, presenting as human? Do you mean currently in our current time cycle or in Woody's time cycle now or 1969, eight? Both or either. Okay. So um, at the time that Woody Derenberger met him, and it seems like Woody is probably the first person on earth to meet him that we have documented okay i was gonna say that has talked to anybody about it yeah he looked pretty human um some other people have described him as like his features being off like Mm. like maybe he doesn't have ears (laughs) but woody was just like so there are interviews that you can find online of woody derenberger describing his first meeting with injured cold he's like written books about it Mm. he ruined his life talking about injured cold um he met him on like the side of the road one night he was driving home woody was a sewing machine salesman and he was on his way home to point pleasant sees lights on the road thinks that it's police he thinks that it's like a traffic stop or something Mm -hmm. as he gets up there he stops thinking it's cops and then sees that it is some sort of spacecraft and (laughs) Injured Cold gets out and can like that's high strangeness. Like to see a UFO, that's strange. To see a UFO and then a person who looks human climbs out of it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like now we're especially weird. And uh he comes over pretty nonchalantly, um, smiling. And so I think that here is where we get to like the, the Grinning Man, Man crossover. Yeah. Um Woody describes him as, like, he's just like a guy. He was, like, tall and handsome, and he was, like, tan, and his hair is brushed back. And he comes over and asks uh, telepathically, what are you called? And Woody's like, Woodrow Derenberger. (laughs) Like, (laughs) oh, okay, yeah. No, like, oh, so you're asking in my brain? (laughs) Like, just casually answering the telepathic Hmm. question. I am curious if he answered telepathically or if he spoke out loud. loud. I don't know the answer. I feel like my gut reaction would be that he spoke out loud as like a, oh, I'm talking to people. Let me just... I don't even know that I would necessarily realize that it was telepathy. Yeah. Like, if it, like, happened that naturally. Um, And then... And so the, the conversation is, like, pretty... Pretty casual. Um, Injured Cold asks, like, "Eh, what is your time cycle always? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Woody's like, 2 (laughs) a.m. Like, doesn't understand the question. Um, And Injured asks, this is a very interesting exchange that uh, I come back to a lot thinking about ultra terrestrials. Um, Injured asks, why are you afraid? We want nothing but happiness for you. He essentially says, like, be not afraid, like angels do in the Bible. Yeah. And so it's like, that's an interesting detail, in my opinion. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I don't know, Indrid, yeah, he just starts, like, hanging out with him Hmm. throughout his life, like, for years. Uh, Woody and Indrid are in contact, like, their family considers Indrid Cold a family friend. And uh, he like comes and hangs out with Woodrow's kids and they describe like building rocket ships out of cardboard boxes and like pretending to fly around That's space so with fucking injured cold. Isn't that cute? Um, and it, I mean, I wasn't kidding. It really ruined 
Darren Berger's life, it, the movie represents like a very accelerated rate. I don't. That sounds really sweet. So how how does it go so south? It's not Indrid's fault. It's like society's fault. Like that's fair. The media represents Darren Berger as like crazy, losing his mind. People are like crank calling him, but Darren Berger is obsessed and he believes that he has met this ultra terrestrial and he like never changes his story to the day mm-hmm. he die he dies. He never changes his, mm-hmm. his story. Um, and it just like, I don't know, it like ruined his reputation. He was like a laughing stock essentially. And um, he did end up going to the doctor. What, so was because, he like leak? N- um, Cause leak was like, my wife left me. My children don't talk to me anymore. They think I'm crazy. Uh, no, Darren Berger's kids actually, one of them says that she is still in contact with injured colds. What? Children. Wait, what? Um, yeah. He has at least two sons. Um, <laughs> and she says that they still like visit her on like mother's day and bring her flowers. <laughs> Where is she? We got like a couple days. We can go, we can jump in there. You'll meet her in season two of hell. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Should they just hang out outside the house on Mother's Day? Oh, well, she's in a um, in an assisted living facility. Should they hang out says, inside the assisted living facility and pretend that they're not visiting her? I mean, that's what I'm saying. They did. Uh, they do leave them a note. But the other thing is, so the reason I was asking you earlier, like, when are you interested in injured cold, is the accepted truth um, in the... Fortean community right now is that Indrid died in a uh, <laughs> craft accident. Okay. Fiery, I thought you were fire and flames. Like, spelunking. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was being chased by um, something, space critters. I don't remember. Uh, passed away. But this gal, uh, Darren Berger's daughter, says maybe that's not true. So Okay, got to jump in on that. What's your time cycle? Yeah. I, have, I can't. <laughs> I don't even, my brain isn't wide enough. No, it's crazy. And I don't know. I have all of these books that I need to like read way more about because I'm sure that like if anybody is listening, they're like, no, I know injured cold and you're getting all of this wrong. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Woody Derenberger did go to the doctor because everybody mm. was like, you're crazy. And he was like, fuck, maybe I'm crazy. Oh. So he goes and they're like nothing on the CAT scans, nothing on the MRIs, like no chemical imbalances. We can't find anything either physically or like chemically wrong with you. Um, his wife does leave him and he ends up like leaving Point Pleasant to – yeah. You know, get away because Point Pleasant is a little town. Even today, it's like 10,000 people. It's tiny. And so he's, there's just no escaping it. Um, he does end up moving back there in his older years mm-hmm. and uh, isn't talking about it anymore. Like in the older years, he's just not bringing it up. Yeah, to let it go. Is he still? No, he passed. Um, yeah early 2000s i think and um but yeah he he like never walked it back i guess in the movie it is an accelerated version no children but Mm -hmm. he becomes obsessed with andrew cole and then ends up yeah dying technically it seems like in the movie though he dies because of it i am very curious about what was going on in that scene yeah and here's why Mm -hmm. The most interesting part, right, is that sometime after Woody, sorry, um, Gordon Gordon, has has passed in the movie, Mm -hmm. Richard Gere gets a phone call from him. Mm -hmm. And the conversation is highly strange. (laughs) Yeah. And he's like, like, I can't believe I got through to you. I can't believe I got through. So, like, he just got a call from beyond the grave yeah or is he in space now <laughs> like where'd he go is he in another dimension where'd he go yeah where he is good yet scary question because one read in the movie is that it was suicide 
right? Mm -hmm. Like he went outside, he's like barefoot, died of exposure. I thought it was much like when he was on the bridge, he's just waiting. Yeah, he said he was waiting for him. I just assumed that he was waiting where he thought he needed to wait. Yeah. And that ended up, to your point, being the end of him. That's a very interesting thing to put in this yeah. movie. It is weird that this movie <laughs> got made. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the um the like weird electronic voice, I don't think that that's part of it. However, weird phone calls are like weird mm. phone calls all throughout this. Um John Keel gets a bunch of phone ca- from Indrid Cold and other ultra terrestrials, not just phone calls but like letters. Yeah. Um he also uh so this is something that I should point out about the book is that it's like a series of um some essays from like John Keel's perspective mm. and some like recaps essentially of interviews that Keel conducted with people in Point Pleasant. Okay. And so it's very like episodic mm-hmm. and like um I think that the movie did a really great job of representing this. You hear about these stories from the people who experienced them. And there are, there are very few that you experience yourself. So it's always like a little bit removed, which I think Mm. is like Mm -hmm. a big part of, um, of high, of a lot of high strangeness cases where you're just like, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. you don't have all the evidence you're having to rely on like word of mouth and whether you trust people and like you're trying to put all these pieces together. And I think that the movie did a really great job of that. And so yeah. that's what um that's how the book is is too. And so he's telling these stories that sometimes seem disconnected. And one of them is that um John Keel was into weird stuff for a long time. <laughs> and he's pretty sure that like some government agency was tapping his phone. Oh. And he had a contact at the phone company Mm -hmm. who was able to verify, like, something weird is for sure going on here. And part of it is, um, so he is getting phone calls from people, sounds like them. It's like the scam that's going on now where you're getting phone calls from, like, your nephew who needs money. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like, like Mm -hmm. he's getting phone calls from people and And then later meeting up with them That's what I thought whenever I was listening to the, or watching the movie, I was like, oh, they had those AI voice things back then. That's so impressive. (laughs) Just a bunch of deep fakes. <laughs> yeah, just doppelgangers left and right. So he's getting phone calls from people and then meeting them in real life and they have no idea. And he's meeting people in real life and they're like, our phone conversation last night was crazy. And he's like, "I that wasn't me. Oh, and geez. he comes to find out that somebody oh, wait. else. Are we talking about the character or are we talking about the real guy? We're talking about the real guy. In real life. This is from. That's weird. The book, The Mothman Prophecies. He's. I mean, you know, it depends on if you believe him. Right? Yeah. Um, but this is the this is the story is that he finds out that somebody else has his phone number mm-hmm. and that somebody else like they both have the same phone number at the same time. Yeah. And so um that guy is answering the phone as though he is John Keel. Like it's not an accident that this other person has his phone number. And so <laughs> Eventually, he calls his own number, oh. gets put through to other John Keel. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Isn't that weird? And I, I can't remember what came of it. I, I'm pretty sure he was just like, uh, bye. <laughs> <Hung Yeah. up. laughs> but like, what a surreal experience. Can you imagine? Especially if he sounded like you. Yeah. Like if you, That would be a nightmare. I would never want to talk to myself. That, no. no thank you. I have a bad enough time editing yeah. ourselves. <laughs> No, that's crazy. That's crazy. But that got me thinking, like, nobody answers their phone anymore. How much, how how much, like, high strangeness are we missing? They got to start texting us. Indrid, text me. 479. (laughs) Yeah, so in the, I almost said in real life. In real life, question mark? The only, really the only quote unquote prophecy is the presence in the water. Like, that's oh, a real okay. dream that Mary Heyer had. Um, not the, like, wake up 37. And she described it prefer- before yes. the bridge. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, it's 
it's weird. That's a weird one. Uh-huh. But like Woody Derenberger didn't have all of these crazy premonitions. Mm-hmm. Um, just hanging out with Indrid. Just hanging out with Indrid. And Keel wasn't told like there's going to be like the bridge is going to collapse or whatever. Yeah. Um, he was told not by Indrid Cold, but by Men in Black that when the president like does the like tree lighting ceremony on Christmas Eve, there would be a nationwide blackout. Oh. And so he was like on red alert for that, like watching the news wire all leading up to Christmas Eve. And that's when he heard, like that's how he got the news that Mm -hmm. um, the silver bridge had collapsed in point. Oh, weird. Yeah. Super weird. And also like, how'd they get that wrong? (laughs) So in the movie, they do talk about how so there was going to be something that happened on the Ohio River. On and he mm-hmm. was like, "That's you have to." And then he left, but the the actual bridge was like the next day or two days after or something like that. Yeah, the, I don't. I didn't pay much attention to the timeline. If I'm being totally yeah, that's honest, fair. <laughs> it was hard to keep up with. Uh, yeah, it's just weird, right? You just have yeah. to like go with the weirdness, the strangeness, the I guess is the term. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So he wasn't like on the bridge, um, the, when this happened and this was like a real, I mean, this was a big tragedy, right? Like, and it's how that small, that's a lot of people that you like everyone exactly ha- knew at least a couple people on that. Yeah. Everyone was impacted. And, Something that's interesting is that leading up to this, so the first Mothman sighting happens 13 months before the bridge collapses. Mm. And in those 13 months, we have 100 documented cases of Mothman sightings that are, I mean, and like, obviously not all of those are going to be real, but all of them were like believable, which means that there were even more uh, reports Mm -hmm. that like maybe weren't. Um, oh, and then yeah. after the bridge collapses, nothing, no more sightings. They abruptly stop. So were, are there any, anywhere else? Yes. Um, there have been a handful of sightings since then for years, none. And then in 2017, a flap of sightings. Are you familiar with the term flap? No, but I assume okay, that means a- like a handful. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, um, that's another like UFO term. Okay. Um, a flap is just like a bunch happening okay. all around the same time. And, uh, um, a flap of Mothman sightings occurs in Chicago in 2017. Okay. To my knowledge, there was no catastrophe. Oh, okay. I was trying to think of what happened in Chicago in 2017. I, I can't I think of anything. Um, yeah, but it was weird. Like a bunch of people saw it and a lot of them were uh the ones that i remember most clearly are a couple people who worked at what's the big airport o'hare o'hare a couple people who worked at o'hare they were um (laughs) they've got the like lights they direct Mm -hmm. people flights airplanes pilots (laughs) air traffic controllers yes thank you air traffic controllers a couple of them witnessed mothman and oh. like that's i feel like that has a lot of credibility because they're out there looking at the sky all the goddamn day yeah. like they know what the birds out there look like they saw a fucking mothman so was there so they say like the mothman is like normally sighted before something terrible happens but do you think do you think he's an ultra terrestrial mm. or there's a group i don't know we can't say that there's just one maybe mothman is an entire race I don't know. Could I don't be. know. Um, but could they show up during historical events and maybe that one wasn't one where people passed? Yes. I agree with that. I think that it's like... Is it people that ensure the timeline? <gasps> Ooh. They're just like, we're here making sure that the exact thing happens that we expect to happen. So do you think that like the Silver Bridge was a fuck up and that Mothman had to go back to his boss and be like, gee... I told Richard Gear, and he did not. Stop or maybe it. something happened where it didn't. It didn't break, and they were like, Ugh, "Oh, gotta you go need back to go back and it. fix that. You need to go yeah. back and make sure that happens. <laughs> you got to make sure it happens, man." And they're like, "The thing is, you have to do that thing where you tell them it's going to happen 
because then they won't believe it's going to yeah, happen. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, it's like they're nagging. Mothman read the game. Is that what it's called? Mm. The game. The art. The game. Art of the game. Game of the art. Whatever. That dumb book that teaches you how to nag. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that like lines up really well with the movie with the like, like that Mothman was sowing the seeds two years prior Mm -hmm. to uh, the Point Pleasant sightings with Richard Gere's wife. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's not Mm. true in real life. Uh, Mm. John Keel never married. He is often described as a confirmed bachelor. What does that mean? Well, Mothman is now a queer icon. So this is a personal pet theory. I don't know if this has, I don't (laughs) even know if anybody else has this theory. I just read like lifelong bachelor and I was like, gay, got it. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if that's true. It's a new time. He's in, it's a new time. It's a new time cycle. He and the Mothman can get together. No one's going to stop him. Oh, wait, you're, you're now shipping John Keel and Mothman? No, I love it. I just want them both to be happy. I do too. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, back to Mothman's motivation. I've always thought of him as like like a moth to the flame of oh, big events. Oh, okay. And like <laughs> some people say that they saw him on 9-11. Oh, really? I don't I don't believe that. There are a lot of pictures. Do you think if we flip through them, maybe we could see them in the corner? I don't know that I want to, like, really scour the pictures from 9-11. Those are pretty hard Not to look at. Not all of them. Oh, well, but you know that those bad ones are the ones he's going to be in. I know. <laughs> I'm typing it in. I shouldn't No, do this. stop. <laughs> <laughs> Images. Okay, this is a different image. Okay, what year was this, 2017? WCHS had a... Somebody caught what they thought was Mothman on video. Did you look Ooh. at that? Uh-uh. It looks interesting. The legs don't look right. That's my only thing. Also, this looks like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people would say that about every Mothman sighting. I'm looking at the 9-11 uh, pictures, and I'm like, well, there are pictures. It could be. It could, it could be. Anyway, so... <laughs> Indrid Cole, Mothman, Richard Gere, Bridge Falls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this bridge did legitimately collapse. And at the end of this movie... They said they don't know what it is. But no, we they absolutely did say know what, what it, is. it is. They said exactly We've what it is. For sure know what it is. <sighs> and like knew it pretty immediately. Like we know what happened. Um, it was a one of the I-beams on the suspension bridge uh, had... Uh, a fault in it part of it cracked yeah. and that crack was like not in a place that we could observe it mm-hmm. and it wasn't being like inspected enough and so when everybody was on this bridge like trying to get home uh around christmas we just had like enough people on it and the crack was finally like this imperfection was finally weak enough which i think would have been fine as the like i think if they could be like this is what happened yeah that, that would have been fine that would have been a fine answer for the resolution yeah. of the film still <laughs> like i don't think not knowing even watching it i was like oh he didn't cause it like he didn't cause the no plane my crash. didn't cause this no i just was like with the conversation once again they conflated injured Cole with mothman and they yeah. made it seem like the same person so whenever richard gear was on the phone with him and he kept like Asking him questions, and he's like, "Are you reading my mind? Are you predicting things?" Mm. And then he did the book thing. I was like, "Okay, he just knows what's going to happen. Yeah. It doesn't mean yeah, he caused exactly. it. He just knows it." Oh, he's Bruno. What? We don't talk about Bruno. No, no. Encanto. You don't watch Encanto? No, I'm an adult. Well, that's Bruno. <laughs> 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 well, there's like a character in it played by John Leguizamo. Oh. Um, who doesn't love a, a good John Leguizamo? And he tells the future and everybody hates him because oh. he tells the future. And they're like, that's not what I wanted to hear. And they're like, well, he's like, that's what I see. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. He's Woody Darenberger. <laughs> yeah. He's just like, I can't help it. I didn't, I didn't make it happen. I just know that it's going to happen. You know, now that we're talking about it, 
I can't even re- really remember if Indrid Cold told the future. Mm. Like in real life, quote unquote. Maybe it's just like, I'm just hanging out. It's just a nice place. I like the weather. Not a lot of prophecies in the Mothman prophecies, if I'm being totally honest and with you. And they're real really in the book? Either. There are a more... couple prophecies in the movie. Yeah, a couple. Because a lot of it is about the prophecy and not so much just about the Mothman. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, not a lot. Not a lot in in the book. Uh, those weird sightings of the Mothman are very strange, though. That woman um, in the movie who is describing seeing him out her window and how she's like... Yeah. She was like Transfixed. frozen and yeah. couldn't move. That's from the book. Hmm. And then the two couples or the couple with um, the bloody oh, eyes. the kids in the movie. I can't remember the bloody eyes. I would uh, believe that because that's like pretty common with UFO sightings, which is oh, okay. that you get like, um, a, like a sunburn. Oh. Um, very bloodshot eyes. Um, sometimes like radiation burns Mm. and okay so this is something that i wanted to talk about Mm -hmm. uh wait wait wait. sorry let me finish this this thought about Mm -hmm. this this woman who was transfixed this was maybe the only like scary scene in the movie to me which was she's describing seeing the mothman and that like i was transfixed i couldn't move i couldn't scream yeah that was common amongst Mothman sightings. Huh. And then they, they're they like out there looking at the tree where she saw him talking amongst themselves. And she describes that he just like flew away. And then we get this like weird drone yeah. shot with kind of grainy vision as though we're seeing from the Mothman's eyes. Yeah. But they're not seeing him. That was like... Oh, that was like scary he could to be me. there, but you don't know he's there. Yeah, and Ooh, that's yeah. very like that's high high strangeness. Um, just like I don't know, that's spooky. Like yeah. you're being watched right now from like ten feet away. Yeah, that is terrifying. Um, yeah, but that that was something I wanted to talk about. So at the top, I asked, "Did we accidentally watch an alien movie?" And you were oh. like, "What?" <laughs> yes, I was like, what? "I think." I think we maybe watched an alien movie. I mean, I think that that feels accurate, but I don't know that, like, to your point, you have... Okay, let me ask this question. Ultra mm-hmm. terrestrials don't necessarily mean from another planet. It could just mean from another dimension or timeline, correct? Yep. Yeah. So I feel like Mothman might not necessarily be from another planet. So what we consider, like, alien today... Might not be accurate, but I think that he is definitely something not from our plane and time. Yes. Um, and we are getting into some high strangeness literature. So John Keel frequently described people who believed in extraterrestrials and UFOs as like coots. He thought that they were crazy. He thought that they were dumb. Um, Didn't until he became he, one of them. Nope. What, bitch? Wait, girl, it's bigger. Mm-hmm. It's bigger than okay, that. Okay. And you oh, are going to be on a John Keel trajectory. Come with me. <laughs> so <laughs> he now subscribes to ultra terrestrials rather than extraterrestrials. Okay. And it's not just that extraterrestrials are ultra terrestrials. He believes that, like, all of this paranormal stuff is a symptom of this one thing. Oh. So, like, not that ultra terrestrials are like a unified, everybody's one, mm-hmm. but that, like, Bigfoot, Mothman, Loch Ness, ghosts, demons mm-hmm. all come from some that other. They are all ultra terrestrials rather than, like, these disparate, unconnected phenomena. Yeah, that's fair. I think I agree yeah. with them. The little goblins from Hellier? Yeah, for sure. Fairies from the past? Oh. I guess maybe we still have fairies today. I just think of them as like <laughs> Victorian. <laughs> yeah. So that's this whole... Are that's they this the big, fae? Yeah, the fae. The fae. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. this whole other theory of the paranormal that he subscribes to. And that uh, I think is becoming more common in the 
paranormal space. I I would not I would not say that it is common, mm-hmm. but it is more common than it once was. I feel like there are I feel like there are extraterrestrial. I still think that there is life out there on other planets or other I agree. Yeah. in other universes or whatever. I feel like there's still life out there, but I feel like there's still a possibility of life once again, just in the 4D, a 5D. I don't know. What are the Ds, the dimensions, the other dimension? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and we'll talk about that more, I guess, when we get into Men in Black later yeah. in a couple of weeks. Yeah, no, I just think that the world is like wide and very strange. Yeah. And I don't know. There's a lot of stuff out there. I mean, we see the world as we perceive perceive it, and the most we can perceive it is with our five senses. It doesn't mean that there aren't more dimensions or more more layers to it that we just can't experience. Absolutely. And maybe eventually in our evolution we can, but right now we just can't. Yeah, I mean, only time will tell. But they touch on that a very little bit in this movie. Something that Leek says made me think of You Should Have Left. Oh, uh, do you yeah. remember in You Should Have Left when the shop clerk is like, does an ant understand what God does or whatever? I don't remember yeah. what he said. But like, even Leek was like, do you try to explain to your motivations to yeah. cockroaches? Like, that's not <laughs> like they're just so different from us and we're like nothing to them. So why would they need to yeah. like communicate with us thinking? I don't know. This is all very interesting Mm -hmm. all of this is very interesting to me oh but speaking of of um ultra terrestrials and ufos this is you'll hear the term nuts and bolts when you're Mm -hmm. talking about ufos in a lot of the ufo (laughs) literature feels (sighs) generous maybe (laughs) yeah (laughs) but you'll hear nut like there are a couple different factions in the ufo community Some believe nuts and bolts, which Mm -hmm. is like there are physical spaceships showing up to our planet from other planets. Mm -hmm. Nuts and bolts. And then there is this more like wooey woo thought of ultra terrestrials, which is that maybe they're from other dimensions and they are like actual entities that exist. Or maybe this is, and the movie Mothman Prophecies gets into this. Uh Maybe this is like a collective thing that we're all sort of manifesting Tulpa style (gasps) as a way to like make sense of things. You know, I love a good Tulpa story. We love a Tulpa. Or do we? I don't know. It's complicated. (laughs) Yeah. I might be more afraid of a Tulpa. I don't know. Uh, well, I think it depends on who made the tulpa. True. <laughs> I was like, I really liked the empty man. And I was like, the main dude was fine. I liked him a lot. So I don't know. Oh, but he was made by crazy people. Yeah. He's great. Spoiler. Sorry. Spoiler for empty man. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. This was, this was really fun. Yeah. I loved watching this movie. And this is, like, exactly the stuff that I am super interested in right now. Writing notes for this episode, I was like, oh boy, I'm about to go off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad, because there was a lot that I, like, I did have questions about, and I think you answered most of them. Um, yeah, and I just had so many open questions about Indrid Cole, but it was so interesting to hear more about him and Woody's relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the thing that I was most focused on that I feel like didn't pan out in the movie as much as I would have liked. That one scene with the phone call where like where Gordon calls Keel yeah. or Klein at the hotel and says like, oh, Injured is here with me. Uh he, put him on. He wants to talk to you. He wants to say hi. I don't know. That phone call is so funny. And I wondered I have seen a lot of memes about this movie. I have a question. There was one trivia. Okay, you go. Memes. Just about uh, the chapstick. I, I always see chapstick related to the movie, and I've never understood. I do appreciate that it was chaps. I That was the first chapstick um, product placement I have seen. And as the biggest fan of chapstick, uh, <laughs> that moment, it just really spoke to me. I did wonder, is that was that product placement? Like, did chapstick pay money? To be featured in the Mothman. I mean, prophecies? if you were to, if Chapstick were to choose which movie they would want to be associated with, <laughs> you think I feel it would like be they're the very highbrow. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, 
they've captured me to like I I cannot think of someone who is a bigger bigger fan of chapstick, the chapstick brand, than <laughs> I am. Um, to the point where I almost my uh, current significant other, we have been together for nearly a decade, uh, almost did not continue to date me because the amount of chapsticks. I had in my purse on her. He was like, what's a weird fact about you? And I was like, I have at least 30 chapstick in my purse. And he was like, I don't believe you. And I was like, okay. And then I sat them out on the table like a crazy person. Are you injured cold? (laughs) Uh, Do you think these lips are uh, not famished? Wait, no. How do you say not chapped? I don't know. Not dry. Moist. Ew. Never mind. uh, Saturated. Ew. Saturated. Um, I do like that. Saturated is fine. Do you not like saturated? You like saturated less than moist? Saturated with what, I guess, is... Chapstick. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I was excited about the chapstick, but I was like, I wouldn't have chosen... I think it was strawberry. It wasn't even cherry. That wasn't the chapstick I would have chosen for the oh. brand placement. I would have probably gone with the original. Who's got the blue the one? Was it blue? No, it was pink. Or it was like a lighter red. If you went with the darker red, that's cherry, but I expected it to go with black, which is the original one. That's like the semi-Carmex one. But the blue one is Mm. also an original one, but usually that's moisturizing. If you go with the light blue, it's medicated. Okay, thank you. The more you know. (laughs) But I loved that. That was probably my favorite scene. Yeah, that's a great scene. It is chapstick. (laughs) That's why I'm not scared. Any moment that was supposed to be scary, the he was like, "It's chapstick," and I was like, "Oh, okay. You just calm me down." Like. Did they try to figure out what things made me not anxious? And then they peppered them in. <laughs> they peppered them in whenever they're like, this is going to be scary chapstick. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm fine. This is fine. People will be soothed by this. You just like your ass. lips are soothed yeah. by this brand. Yeah, it was. It was incredibly. <laughs> but I did read like a um, a really dumb trivia, which I don't know. I don't think it's true. And I tried really hard to substantiate it tell prior. Me, tell me. It is on the IMDb. I do not think it's true. Okay. But it said that Richard Gere had some strange, there was some strangeness on set and he (gasps) had heard injured coal in his brain or in his mind and then he shit his pants. (laughs) 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 And the trivia said he defecated in his trousers or something and I was like, shit his pants, gotcha. Shit his pants. They had to like stop filming for a little bit for him to clean up and then start filming again. And I was like, I would like to read anything that substantiates this because I would be very happy if this was accurate. But Wikipedia and IMDb, I feel like you're both letting me down. Cite your sources. Where is this coming from? Is this a direct interview? So much more information. I don't know. I, you know, I did see, um, I guess. On the, like, DVD, there was a bunch of extra content Mm -hmm. um, about filming and, like, interviews with the director. Um, And it sounds like filming was brutal. Like, it was cold. Lots of night shoots. Yeah. And so everybody was, like, sleepy and uncomfortable. And uh, they lost so much money like the day before filming started like the studio called and was like we're we're nuking your budget it sort of feels like maybe the chapstick thing was like pulled in to be like we need a little bit we gotta make it high strange (laughs) what if we got on set everybody check your pockets (laughs) Like, like what happened um and i've also heard that Maybe that's why all of the UFO men in black stuff was dropped from the movie. Oh, I thought it was interesting that there wasn't anything in it about men in black. You know what I do have access to and I should have read this before we recorded. We'll have to do like a follow up special episode about it later. So I am a uh, Patreon member to um, Greg and Dana Newkirk's museum yes the folks who do hellier mm-hmm. um i'll put a link to that in the in the description Were they because the it's like the haunted objects podcast haunted objects podcast mm-hmm. and predating that their haunted objects museum okay gotcha and i'm on their patreon in the tier where you get access to their case files Ooh, fun! and i know so fun and you also get like 
close-ups of some of their museum objects. And one of the things that they have is... (laughs) Okay, I've got two things to tell you about. One of the things that they have is an earlier script of the movie. Oh, I thought you were going to say a haunted chapstick. No haunted chapstick that they have released to the Patreon. (laughs) Maybe they've got it (laughs) at the museum. Uh, And boy, I really meant to read that before we recorded and I mismanaged my time. Uh, But apparently it's like weirder. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see what's in that one. And two, that ending scene where the bridge collapses. Yeah. That was a miniature. They built. Wow. They did a good job. Miniature set. They did a great job. And the other thing that the new Kirks have is one of the cars. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And it's like um, they were remote control so Mm -hmm. that you know we could operate them and they had like real brake lights that work and stuff that's adorable and yeah i watched a little featurette on the people who built the bridge and the cars and it was very interesting the uh it was a dad and son's combo which is so cute yeah and I guess the dad had been in the field for like years and years and years. He was an old man at this mm. point. And his, one of his sons like took the lead on this movie in particular. And <laughs> listening to the dad, he was like, I really just like pointed at stuff and he like did it. <laughs> um, and then I think the other son like got out of the field. But uh, he was lamenting the fact that like they make it look too real. That people don't realize that there are people, like, building that. And so, like, people in Hollywood don't know to reach out to him for work because, he like, it's too good. They did a really great job. I had no idea. I had no idea. No, it looks incredible. Mm -hmm. The, like, miniature was bigger than I would have thought. Mm. I'll link it. It it was cool. It's cool to watch. So I'm going to need you to also watch the featurette to see if he did shit his pants. I'll see. I'll see. I'll see what I can find. (laughs) I'll I'll Google. (laughs) I just want. I just want to know. I want to believe. (laughs) As always. Um, How do you feel about not seeing the monster? Was it effective? Yeah. I think it could have ruined it with this movie. Yeah. I think they did a good job showing it in very little flashes. When they did show it. And not even really showing it. Just seeing like the red red eyes. Yeah, they're giving it more to your brain, which I appreciate. You bought this. Do you feel like that was the right decision? (laughs) (laughs) I did. I did. I would say a rent. I do not think I would say a a buy. Yeah, I just don't. There are some scenes that I will want to watch again. But the movie as a whole, I don't think I'd want to sit through the whole thing. I think that I will. That's fair. So I think that, like, listener, you're going to have to make a judgment call. On yeah. This one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was very, it was weirdly a comforting movie for me. I don't know if I, like, watched it a lot on TNT or had it in the background whenever, oh. like, but it, like, it didn't scare me enough for me to be, like, but it was enough for me to not get scared of it. And anytime there was something that was heightened, it, I would immediately, like, I don't know. We talk about like chemicals, fight or flight. Mm-hmm. Once something triggered, it immediately dropped. Like I couldn't, oh, yeah. it didn't keep me heightened. And I don't know if it's because I had seen it on TV or it had been in the background mm-hmm. on TV when I was younger. So that might be something that is specific to me. Yeah. I don't know. I also wasn't scared, but I was enthralled and I th- thought a lot. Like I was very mm-hmm. engaged. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen often. I have short attention span and I'm like, hmm, what's on Twitter? So Mm -hmm. like it was Mm -hmm. nice to it was nice to be like invested. Yeah. But this is the end of our cryptid series. Yeah. Should we rank the cryptid movies? Okay, let's do it. Uh I can give my ranking. Wow, so fast? Yeah, I feel like I do have it. Skinwalker Ranch last. Yeah. Dog Soldiers. Dog Soldiers first. first. Yeah. Abominable second for me. Girl, same. <laughs> what is what it what was the other one we did? Antlers. I think I do I would do Antlers three, Mothman four. I'm gonna invert those two. I'm gonna do Mothman three. It Antlers was like four. a close one for those two. Yeah. But I really liked the monster in Antlers. And I think that that's yeah. where I because that was like the only thought in my head. It's not the entire movie that got me, but that one scene where they did show the monster. 
No, the monster is sick in Antlers. Yeah. I'm just thinking about rewatchability. Oh. I'm going to watch. I'm going to reach for Mothman prophecies before I do Antlers. Yeah, Antlers was a, a more exhausting watch. Yeah. Like, I'm excited by Mothman prophecies. And I think Antlers is like... I think it will be based on my mood. But we can all agree, Dog Soldier is best one we watched. Oh, 100%. <laughs> without a doubt. I can't And Abominable. Such a nice surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I I honestly genuinely love this series. I loved the series. I was not. And I know we talked about it last time and I was like, I was not excited about it. But this was probably one of my favorite series that we've ever done. I also thought it was funny, like looking back, thinking about one of our like early production calls, trying to order the movies. Yeah. We were like, Dog Soldiers is going to suck. So, like, sweep that one under the rug because we're just going to, like, make jokes and it's going to be bad. Yeah. (laughs) We were so wrong. (laughs) But we did say Abominable was going to be so bad. But I thought – I don't think it was bad. I think it was, like – No. Smartly – I think it was smart. I think it was funny and smart. (laughs) Oh, so good. It was – this was the most unexpected series, I think. I agree. In honesty, I was most excited about Mothman prophecies. Yeah. I was willing to like ignore all of the movies. And then yeah. that was the one that I was the least excited about at the end. Oh, that's a bummer. And I was super excited about Skinwalker Ranch. And that ended up being just a pile of poop. That was the most disappointing yeah. of the movies we watched in this series. But, I mean, it's it was fine. It wasn't like the worst movie we've seen. No, not by a long yeah. shot. So I, I don't want to like completely <laughs> poo-poo on it. Uh, I thought it had, it did have redeemable qualities and I would like to see what the directors do next. I remember that one, I, I was kind of like upset they hadn't done anything since then. I hope they get a chance to. I mean, my, I'm sticking with my hypothesis that they got got on Skinwalker Ranch. It was a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fair. <laughs> Only time will tell. No, next week we'll be talking about Monster by Frank Peretti, who has been described to us as the Christian Stephen King. And we will have special guest Kylan Savage of Church Jams Now joining us. He's actually read it. I don't think we're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> we might we might flip through it or speed read through the speed listen through the the audio yeah. book. We'll see how it goes. We'll figure it out when it happens. (laughs) Otherwise, we're just going to shoot the shit. (laughs) Yeah. Join us next week and check out Church Jams Now. We were guests over there last year to talk about Evanescence's uh, first album, Fallen, um, which was super fun for Mm. us. So uh, check that out. And in the meantime before next week when we come back for that you can find us over on debut buddies with our friend nate regolia where we will be talking about the first episode of the x-files which is a nice dovetail because they also do some high strangeness stuff over there um yeah so check that out and if you could please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and you can find us on the social media at no show monster the social media you know all of them all of it um email us no show monster at gmail.com and we will see you next week happy spooky happy spooky <laughs>